I'd like to call this meeting to order. Be it resolved, the Board of Supervisors hereby enters into closed meeting for the purpose of discussing the following. Under section 2.23711, discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community. One is 2014-006, the other is 2014-017. Under three, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for the purpose, for the public purpose of the disposition of public or held real property where a discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. One uh, under that is Allegheny Springs. Two is Mid County. Discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, discipline, or resignation of specific officers, appointees, or employees of any public body. The, uh, the Community Service Board, the Parks and Recreation Commission, and the Planning Commission. Do I have a motion, please? Motion moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Fitz? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Chair Brown? We are in closed meeting. Aye. Need a motion to go out of closed session? So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Fitz? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? For Aye. the time that I would. Oh, no, I know what we're saying. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gates? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. The next one. For the time I was there. Certification of closed meeting, whereas the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County has convened a closed meeting on this day, pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2 that's 3711 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Montgomery County, Virginia, hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification resolution applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion conveying the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Fitz. Aye. Ms. Perkins. Aye, for the time that I was there. Mr. Tuck. Aye. Mr. Gaber? Aye. Mr. Craig? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. The next item on our agenda is our invocation. And this is when we observe a moment of silence to reflect on the business at hand. And after observing that moment of silence, we will be led in the pledge by Mr. Meadows, our county administrator. Let us pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. No, it just stuck up another. Next item uh, is delegations and of first and only delegation will be uh, Mr. Kevin Bird from New River Valley Planning District to provide an update. Well, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Appreciate to have a few minutes on your agenda tonight to share an update from the commission. 
Um, in front of you, I've placed a two-page document front and back that is a quick overview of activities over the past year or so and a couple of upcoming items for you all to be aware of. On the right side of that list is our board representation, and you'll see that Ms. Perkins and Mr. Chambers represent Montgomery County. And you also note that there are several folks that have a bold next uh, on their name, and those represent elected <laughs> officials on the board. Our board is comprised of, a, of an elected official from each member jurisdiction, and then some of those that are not bolded are citizen representatives. So the communities that have 3,500 or more in population have a citizen appointee as well. Uh, I like to remind folks whenever we get the chance that the commission is owned by the local governments, so the programs and projects that we take on on an annual basis are really dictated by you all uh, being local governments. Uh, then the activities or the purpose of the commission is threefold in general, is to provide technical assistance to the members, is to provide as a liaison for state, local, and federal government programs, and then also convene the region on issues of mutual interest. So some items we've been working on from Montgomery County over the past year. Um, last year we completed the State for House of School travel plans and grant applications, and then we're moving into project management for Bellevue Elementary School and the Auburn campus improvements. Uh, we, over the past several years, have provided staff support for the nearby home consortium, and they are a likely funder for the Prices Fork Elementary School reuse for a component of senior housing in the future. Um, this next year, we'll be providing grant administration and project management for a grant that was uh, specifically designed to explore local food options as a component of reuse as well for the Prices Fork Elementary School. This past year, we were involved with technical assistance on the stormwater program, and as a result of that, one of our staff members has gone through training and will continue to do training to serve as a backup role for any local governments that have a staff support need in that arena. Um, this past year, we were contracted by the MPO to provide the first pedestrian bicycle master plan for the MPO, and that's to be scheduled to be complete in August. And then uh, this past year, we launched the Near Valley Mayors and Chairs, which is a biannual informal conversation over lunch. It's about an hour and a half to two hours where uh, Chairman Brown and Mr. Meadows come and join their colleagues across the region and talk about issues that are going on in their communities. A nice chance to network for them and talk about some solutions. Um, and then this summer, we're working to coordinate the Appalachian Spring uh, Initiative, which is an outdoor recreation asset development program. So if you look at cultural heritage in Southwest Virginia as a three-legged stool, where one leg is the crooked road for music, around the mountain for craft, the intention of this is to be focused on outdoor recreation and really hope to elevate the awareness of the amazing outdoor recreation assets that we have. A couple of items that are serving the region to bring to your attention. Uh, we've convened the region on a tourism conversation. And uh, for the first time, all four counties in the city have a staff member that is dedicated entirely or in part to tourism. And that's the first time this happened in the region. So we had a conversation a couple months back and we'll have a second conversation in later in July. And then we're also working right now at the Newber Health District on mapping support services for them. And you see this as an opportunity to save them some money so they don't have to invest in a staff person or equipment, but also builds capacity at the funding district and ultimately saves money for local governments and having to invest in another program. So we're looking forward to starting that one in July. If you turn the page, a uh, quick highlight on the nearby livability initiative. Hopefully you all received hard copies of these reports that went out. So we've got these books that were published. This is the culmination of three year planning process, really two and a half years of planning and about a six month period of producing the reports. Um, the first book that you see there is the overall report and this has a lot of the data and trends and um, the book was structured around four different themes. The first is enhancing living and working environments. The second is preserving rural heritage and community character. The third, making the business environment more productive and resilient. And fourth, building healthy communities. And the second two books, we have a regional energy plan and a regional housing plan. Both of these are first for the region and really provide a lot of uh, in-depth detail about housing strategies or strategies for energy within the region. Um, it's, it's really been nice to be recognized this uh, this region effort has received three national awards for innovation and in how we approach the process and approach engaging people um, and getting their good ideas in, included so we had over 3,000 people that participated in the process over two and a half years um, in the next couple of months we're working on transitioning the project to the New River Valley Community Foundation they turned out to be a great partner in this process and uh, was an unanticipated outcome and that 
they have a really neat role where they're raising local money and they're applying that local money to local needs. And what they, they went back and reevaluated their grant making locally to see if they were addressing the needs that were coming out of the data and the trends and the public conversations that we had with livability. And so as a result, they made some adjustments to make sure that their local dollars were going to the local needs. And that's been very exciting to see. And we're fortunate that the staff member that was coordinating this project, Kim Thurlow, with the commission is then transferring over to the community foundation. So it'd be a nice seamless approach when somebody's been involved for three years and helping to keep this program going forward. Um, and of note, it was $64,000 raised last year under this, um, this program to help address local needs. A couple things that have uh, resulted, and this is just, you know, half the press, so it's only a couple months old, but a few things that have come out as a result. We have an aging in place leadership team. Early on, we started realizing some of the demographic trends in the communities. Everyone is aging across the country, and particularly in New River Valley. Realized that we wanted to have a community that was um, very accessible for those folks, and also uh, encouraging people to be in. So we have a leadership team that came together to talk about those issues, and they had a summit about a year ago, and um, they created this report called Home Matters. This was released just a couple of weeks ago, and it's on the commission website on our main page, nrvpdc.org, and it's really a guidebook for issues that are fairly common across the region. They're going to have a second convening in, on October 2nd at Blacksburg Transit, and it's going to be a half-day discussion. Some of the topics that we're focusing on are some of the policy issues, such as accessory dwelling units uh, or granny flats that a lot of communities try to figure out how they can accommodate those, um, and also access to transportation and medical care, some of those other issues that are fairly common in the aging population. Uh, another one you might have heard about is the Solarized Blacksburg. This is, didn't formally come out of livability, but it was a strategy that was identified and that we had private sector companies that were working to do this kind of work. We also had nonprofits with an interest. And so it's been a, a collaboration between nonprofits and the private sector to deliver um, alternative energy for individual homeowners in the Blacksburg community. But it seems like a really good example that's transferable to a lot of other communities, not just in the Newer Valley, but across the state. There's been a lot of interest in making this happen in other places. Um, a lot of new collaborators have come to the table as a result of these discussions across the region. And we see the aging discussions, we see the energy discussions that are happening. They have a lot of community capacity now for these organizations that know partners to work with that are identified in that report. So they realize they have other people that, are, that are, have a similar interest. So they collaborate and it's not all work put on the government to do. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention with this process, something that we stumbled upon, didn't realize we were going into it, but it was the output of the process, was this collaborative impact approach where you see the consortium members on the right-hand side, a lot of the local governments in the region, and some key nonprofits, and there were several other private sector partners that were engaged in the process. And what we realized is that the more opportunities you have to diversify that stakeholder or that leadership group, the more opportunities you're going to have people to engage, and you're going to have other organizations carry initiatives forward that aren't relying upon one. And particularly in a rural region like this, that's helpful. When you have multiple people that are able to run the ball one direction, and another might be able to go another way. So it's been very helpful to see the collaboration pick up in the region and to see a lot of projects that are coming out I and mean, it's just a couple months old. So that's a quick update of activities over the past several months of the commission and some things that are on the horizon for us. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have or any comments. Question? Uh, I will make this statement, Kevin, that uh, I really enjoyed the mayors and chairs conference at uh, the exchange of information between the other mayors and, 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 and chairs of the valley and things. I thought that was uh, a very uh, outstanding program that you launched. Yeah, I appreciate hearing that. I'll pass that along to the commission. Uh, and I'll just mention as well, I, we did provide the board a, <clears throat> a set of the of documents, but I've got, a, I've got several extra ones, so if a board member needs an extra copy or if you know somebody that's interested in an extra copy we've got several more in our office that we'd be glad to pass out it's excellent work it's very well documented and good good pathway for the future great thank you a lot of people involved so it reflects upon a lot of people thank you thank you the next item on our agenda is public address uh, session uh, if you would like to speak to the board on any issue of county business, please come to the speaker's podium, speak clearly, and state your name and address using the, the mic. 
Speakers will have a total of five minutes. All comments must be directed to the chair and the board. Both speakers and audience will exercise courtesy during the time that people are speaking. And if you have any written statements, please leave a copy with, with our clerk. Uh, Beth O'Connor is the first person signed up to speak. Good evening. My name is Beth O'Connor. I'm here on behalf of both the partnership, excuse me, New River Valley Partnership for Access to Healthcare and the Virginia Rural Health Association. You have been asked to consider a resolution which states many valid reasons why the coverage gap should be closed to protect the people of Virginia. I would like to add one more reason the economic health of Virginia's small rural hospitals. Many people are unhappy with the Affordable Care Act for a variety of reasons. Some people wanted universal care. Others thought that a single payer system would go too far. So a deal was struck. Hospitals would agree to lower Medicare payments and in return, more people would have insurance through Medicaid. Unlike a business, a hospital has to accept anyone who walks through the door whether or not they are able to pay. If you are hungry and go to a grocery store but cannot get pay, you will not get food. But a hospital has to serve you anyway. If too many people are unable to pay, the hospital will close. On October 1st, Lee Regional Medical Center closed. It is dead. The jobs from that facility are dead. The money it pumped into the local economy is dead. The cause of death, lack of Medicaid expansion. At small rural hospitals, the percentage of people who are unable to pay is high. At Lee Regional Medical Center, that number was 12%. At other small rural hospitals in Virginia, the number ranges from 10% to 20%. Do you know of a business that could stay open if 20% of its customers could not pay the bill? Lee Regional Medical Center supported 190 FTEs. These are not low paying entry level jobs. These are doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, therapists. The hospital was the fourth largest employer in the county, provided $11.5 million in labor costs. If it can happen in one small community, it can happen to others. And while one failing town may not seem to matter in Montgomery County, once the dominoes start to tumble, it will affect everyone. Already, other hospitals in Southwest Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley have had to cut back on their staff. Remember that the Affordable Care Act is a federal program. Therefore, the people of Virginia are already paying for Medicaid expansion. My taxes, your taxes, their taxes are already being used to support Medicaid expansion in other states. We want it here. Please vote in favor of the resolution to close the coverage gap. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Turner. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Turner. I live in Ellet Valley on Ellet Road. The uh, reason for being here, I was here on June the 9th referring to your uh, whether you were to raise or lower the standards on cell towers. As a person who I mentioned then has experienced tremendous problems with cell service, not only just cell phones, but data service as well, since we do get our internet from uh, cell use but I again would like for y'all to allow the tower that's going to go up in Radford or outside of Radford on Peterson Drive to go up to whatever height they need to get it to I believe y'all voted once for a minimum of 150 or a maximum of 150 uh, I can tell you from experience from spending 25 years in the broadcast industry that the higher you can get your tower the better coverage you'll have uh, I feel like we're in an area at home where we should get excellent cell service and data service. And we don't. And it's because the towers that are there cannot reach where we are. And I don't want to see the people who are in this particular region suffer the same consequences that I've had to deal with 
for many, many years. And I would like for y'all to at least give them the minimum that they're asking for, I think is 199 feet. It's in a rural area. There's nothing but woods all the way around it. I've gone out to the site myself personally. I've gone up and down 81 to see if this tower is going to block any scenic view, and it's not. Uh, so if y'all could uh, see it within yourselves on the technical side of what this will do for the people who live in this area, it will help them immensely to cover a lot of gaps and a lot of holes that keeping the minimum to uh, or maximum to 150 feet would, uh, would uh, prohibit a great deal. So if you could go up on that tower height, at least in this particular location, then I would say vote yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Jeff Heiger? Jeff. Hmm. Jeff Geiger. Geiger, okay. I could tell when that's the <coughs> Whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I apologize for I'm the poor spelling. It's G E I G E R. For the poor handwriting. Chair, members of the board, my name is Jeff Geiger here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. I'll just give you a brief recap of the matter that you'll be voting on this evening. Uh, with me again this evening is Guy Randall, an RF engineer with Verizon Wireless, and Drew Patterson, a consultant to Verizon Wireless. Our team is available to answer questions you may have before you take a vote this evening. When we were last before you, there was some concern that the Planning Commission's recommendation was a change in policy. I would like to draw your attention to the policy set out in the staff report and note that it allows for three types of towers. Verizon Wireless requests and the Planning Commission recommended use of one of these types, the stealth model pole painted brown, because of the benefits it would provide to the county, to the citizens for the same reasons that Mr. Turner just enumerated, and to limit the number of towers in this area. The policy does not require flush mounting an approval would not change the board's position in requiring flush mounting for residential areas. Instead, approval would be the adoption of the same precedent used in approving towers along I-81 and other parts of the county, such as the towers that are located along I-81 at mile markers 127 near Norfolk Road, 125, 124, 122, 109, and this one being added at 105. Also, when we were last before you, there was a concern whether the Planning Commission was made aware of your precedent. Chairman Rice and staff made them aware prior to the vote, and before the vote, one of the Planning Commissioners stated that it was his belief that the Commission needed to recommend a change for the benefit it would provide by limiting the number of towers to one and providing co-location opportunities for other carriers. Another commissioner stated before the vote that the application of this policy would have the effect of turning the valley into a pit cushion, and this would be worse for the view shed than having just one tower. Other benefits that the commission sought to achieve included the ability to put today's technology up on the tower using a full array to enhance coverage so that the county can achieve greater coverage with greater height and without flush mounting. So citizens on the roads in the area can reach emergency services, and emergency services can pinpoint their location. So businesses and citizens in Montgomery County benefit from the high-speed, high-quality 4G LTE service that this tower will bring. Approval of the Planning Commission recommendation will turn this area in white with little to no service to green with 4G LTE service and allow other carriers to do the same. T-Mobile has submitted an LOI to Verizon Wireless for co-locating at the 175-foot co-location spot. I uh, apologize. And Telos has submitted that um, LOI. And T-Mobile is evaluating the 165-foot co-location spot. Verizon Wireless is currently reserving the 185-foot spot for the county. I know that Mr. Turner came before you uh, at the June 9th meeting. Uh, Verizon Wireless representative spoke to him at that meeting and followed up with him. Uh, I want to report to you uh, that Verizon Wireless has initiated a project uh, for 
co-locating on an existing tower that would bring improved service to his area of the county, uh, allowing our RF um, waves to propagate down uh, into his home area. Verizon Wireless request that the board approve the Planning Commission's recommendation so that the county can benefit from turning uh, the area in white back to green. Thank you. Thank you. These are all the people who have signed up, but if it's anyone in the audience that who would like to address the board, they can do so at this time. This is my first time, so I'm going to be nervous here for <laughs> Just take your time. <clears throat> and state your name and address. Okay, hang on a second. Let me get the paperwork straight. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for hearing me on this, what I want to talk about. This is my husband, Mark, also. My name's Gail Peters. Okay, I want to address the Board of Supervisors on tax relief. I think you should change the rule when I'm going back a year when you sign up for tax relief. If you are on disability and was on disability the year before, especially if you owe tax the year before. Um, I went to the treasurer's office and I talked to some this morning. I tried to get help and she told me that if I had uh, come before the end of last year, which was 2013, she said she may have been able to help me. All right, I told her that I can only pay $50 a month um, and she told me that that won't get my taxes paid because I'm going to always be incurring taxes every six months, as you know. And um, I told her I wanted to talk to somebody else that I, if I could, I talked to the commissioner. She told me that I had to talk to each and every one of you um, about this to get the, to get that rule and changed to get back help on the, the on real estate taxes. And that's what I'm here today for. Because I know there's people out there just like me, they live on a fixed income and they can't make ends meet. Um, I'm on, I get disability, I get 1066 a month, and I'm sure you know that that's way below the poverty level. My husband, he's disabled, he's also a Navy vet, and I think that should be took in consideration that he is a vet. Uh, he's trying to get his disability, we've got lawyers working on it, and also we get $72 a month in food stamps which you know $72 doesn't go anywhere in the grocery world. I also have to go to social services and community action to get up on my electric bills because, like I say, you know $1,000 a month is nothing. He's also, my husband's also having some really bad health problems. He's had seizures. Uh, we even tried to get medication for him. We couldn't afford it. It's $300. And the doctor said that was going to be cheap, okay? It might be to him, not to us. $300 is a lot of money to us. We're struggling really hard. And, uh, you know, we've even sold our own per personal stuff to pay bills. But, and what I'm trying to say is, I know there's people out there just like us. We, I know me and Mark's not the only person struggling to, think, to make beings meet. But I think you all should give consideration to the ruling of changing the tax relief where you can go back to the year before so we can get tax relief. Because for instance, my, my taxes for last year is $800. That's a lot of money to me. And the, even the commissioner told me when I talk to her that you all have to change the ruling on that and she could help me if you all do change, can change the ruling on that and I would appreciate it if you would and take it into consideration. And uh, she also told me that Montgomery County really wasn't hurt that bad financially so I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not, I just thought I'd bring that up and I appreciate your time and thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address? Would please come forward.
Good evening. Good evening. I'm Cindy Turner. I live on Ellet Road in Christiansburg. Um, thank you all for your time tonight and as well as your service to the county. Um, in my work, I frequently serve families in their homes and throughout the entire New River Valley. And frequently, because of lack of internet service, I'm not able to serve them the way I need to. Forgive me, I'm a little nervous too. Um, that results in having delays and having to send them information by mail, uh, make repeat visits, that sort of thing. So there's no question that we need better cell service in the area. Um, my personal feeling is that we already have towers in place. We can already see them. I feel like that additional towers are more unsightly than just making those towers taller. And I just ask you to consider that tonight when you vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Seeing no one come forward, we'll close the public address session. Do we have an addendum? Yes, sir, we do. The, <coughs> the real estate sales agreement uh, that was discussed in closed session, I believe. <coughs> so we'll have to vote on accepting the addendum, but we'll deal with it on, on the new business. Yeah, I'll make a motion to add it to the um, to the agenda. To the okay. addendum. Sorry. Sorry, to the agenda. Right. Second. Have a motion and a second to add the item to our agenda. And Mr. Meadows, would you just clarify what we're yeah. precisely adding. we're adding? Uh, to yeah. yeah. <laughs> Marty, do you want to? Sure. Um, <laughs> the, the, the item is a resolution approving the proposed uh, real estate purchase agreement with uh, George Ann Snyder, Falkingham in the county, for the county purchasing um, a little more than four acres of property over near uh, Mid County uh, to be the uh, site where the county would construct the new um, animal shelter. And uh, so what the resolution would do would authorize the chair to sign the contract on behalf of the county and enter into the agreement and it, after the due diligence period of roughly 45 days the county decides they want to buy the property then they would purchase the property uh, for the purposes stated thank you and that would that require subsequent action by the board uh, to yes. finalize so this would be this would be it okay. yes okay we have a motion and a second any further discussion i don't object to adding it to the agenda um, it's something that needs to be discussed, but I don't want to mislead anyone. I'm not supportive of the, the purchase at this price. And so, um, but I understand we need to bring it up, and that's the way government works. And so I don't have a problem with adding it to the, uh, as an addendum. Okay. Have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Perkins. Aye. Mr. Tuck. Aye. Mr. Gable. Aye. Mr. Creedy. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Ms. Biggs. Aye. Chair Brown. Aye. Seven ayes. Consent agenda. Mr. Brown, actually, before we leave addend um, the addendum, um, I was wondering if I might um, suggest that we um, add to new business um, the proposed resolution that was forwarded by um, Ms. O'Connor to us. And we might consider that on a new business. The resolution supporting closing the coverage gap for the uninsured Montgomery County and Virginia citizens. Okay, you that put was forwarded to us by uh, Vicki. Yeah, you putting that in the form of a motion. Sir, to I would like to make a motion adding that to the, the resolution uh, to new uh, business. New business, okay. Yes. This would be an uh, addendum, an, uh, yes, an addendum second item. Yes, yes. Second addendum item. I'll okay. second it. So, say we have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Cree? Hi. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm not going to be supporting the, uh, the motion. I'm going to have no problems adding it to our agenda. Okay. Mr. Gable? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. Okay. Two items for new business. Uh, the consent agenda? Move approval. Second. 
I have a motion and a second. Any discussion of any items on the agenda? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Curry? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. The next item is old business. Uh, subject A, special use permit Verizon Telecom Telecommunications Tower. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion in regards to approving it at 199 feet with the build out as described. Second. <coughs> and we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion on? I think uh, just one thing. I think while taking consideration, our staff has checked into it at. Uh, well, I looked real hard at what they recommended. I went up on the property. I went out and talked to several people. I had several people call me. They're kind of concerned about the 14 foot 199. They're really concerned about that part of it. So I think we ought to look real hard at what the staff recommended. You're saying that they were concerned about the 199 plus the yeah, plus the 14, the 14 feet. feet. Both of both of those items. Yes, okay. Okay, uh, Mary, you want to go? Um, okay. I was just going to say that it is in um, Mr. King's uh, district, and um, that's that's a consideration that I I take into making my decision. And um, you know, I just wanted to say that up front. Did Gary? Did you have your hand up? No. Oh. I'm, I'm good. Any? For a few things, one, I, I believe it's going to serve the community well. Um, I think so far all the responses I, I haven't, and I know you may have got some negatives, I haven't received a single negative response. Um, people do believe that the 199, by doing this, it's going to, in my mind, prevent, you, you've already got one other cell wants to co-locate already. And that if we put it at the 150, we all saw what 150 said. And by having it taller, it's going to eliminate the potential of us having to have two or three towers out there. And while I understand what some of the folks are saying, um, it, I, I also understand what some of the other folks are saying that we need this service. This is, you know, there was a point in time where telegraph wires were important and then send a message by telegraph. Well, now I, I dare say that there, every single person in this room has got a cell phone um, and they want to have that cell phone service. And from my perspective, I do believe that that this is consistent with the I-81 corridor. If this was in a neighborhood, I would look at this very, very differently. And I would be looking at, well, how can we hide it more? How can we not have it, you know, it, it flush mount? Can we put it in a steeple? Can we put it on top of a power line? But in this case, every one that I saw along the 81 corridor had, were very tall, and I, I can't tell you how tall each one of them was, but they had the build outs on each and every one of them. And so I think really this is consistent for the I-81. Um, and, and I think it's the right thing for the county and our citizens, but also the people who are passing through, for them to be able to have access to technology as they're going down the highway. Uh, there's not the driver, but the passengers who are now kids are streaming videos and those type things and going down the road. And so uh, that's the reason I'm in favor of it. I think it's truly going to help the county in the long run. Let me say something. Okay. Uh, I'm certainly sure you. I probably didn't have as many calls as you did, and maybe not as many as Chris. I don't know, but I had about 12 to 15 calls. All of them were in favor of it, uh, and they were in favor of it at the largest height that they could get. They would be willing to go higher if they could get, for instance. One of them, I don't even know where they got my name from, but anyhow, they, they're not in my district. <laughs> but they, they called to, and, and to let me know that their daughter was driving back and forth, up and down the interstate there, going to school at Radford. And this would ease their mind a whole lot if they could get coverage that would be out there to cover them as they 
went on their way going to school and this type thing. You know, uh, I think everybody has the right to have it. I think you can't give one person the right to it and then tell somebody else, no, we're not going to do this for you. There's too many people. It, it, it gets past who is living there. It's something that is for the benefit of all, not for the benefit of a few. So, you know, to me, it's a pretty much of a no-brainer, and it's something that is needed. <coughs> the proof that it's needed, and all of these other places, 90% of every place that needs one has got one. And you have no right, in my estimation, to, to say you can't have it just because it's, it's there. I mean, it's, that's, that's all. I got one question on that. Okay. And, you know, each individual both are conscious, but I want to ask you one thing. If they come to your district and they want to put that up and you're, the people in that area didn't want it, would you vote for it in your area? If we need it, I certainly would. I have already. Okay. I, I believe that, you know, my area doesn't have, uh, I get a little bit close to 81 corridor over towards, uh, and to where I mean, Lucy Monroe's because mine kind of takes a turn right there but I would be in favor of it because I believe it's a necessity okay. um, and, and so when it comes to my turn if there's one coming that way out in the county then then yes I would be in favor of it at the same time if it was in a more urban or even near somebody close to somebody's house and a subdivision would I be looking at this very differently absolutely Yeah, commented too before we last meeting. I think we had Ruth do a press release to get comments on this tower, uh, and it didn't generate the comments that I thought that that would be generated from it. Uh, I've seen probably in an email correspondence six or seven at the most, maybe four or five but the ones that I seen was in supportive of the 199 foot tower uh, I thought that once the the release the 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 media release went out regarding the tower that uh, a number of people would come forward and say no not in my neighborhood not in my backyard and things like that uh, and then on the other hand, I look at the Planning Commission's uh, recommendation, but I also give a lot of weight to the staff, the staff's recommendation. It, it almost seemed like uh, uh, they are sort of in conflict with each other. But you have a six to one vote uh, on a Planning Commission and then you have staff's recommendations. So it's a hodgepodge of, 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 of things out there. Probably if it was in the area where I lived, if they was wanting to put one at 300 feet, I'd want it 300 feet because I can't talk to Murray without dropping calls all the time. She said, are you still there? No, <laughs> I mean, because I can't get no service. But I think we have to uh, take all these things in consideration, like people are looking at movies, they streaming more stuff, they get an internet off of, there's a whole lot of needs out there to where maybe the towers 15 years ago did not meet those needs because the request wasn't there. But now, with I guess for long it'd be G5, G6, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say that uh, we didn't get, at least I didn't get, receive a bunch of negative comments opposing the 199 feet. Uh, Mr. Parsh, you want to say something? Well, I guess it's uh, time for a motion or something, man. If somebody's got the motion. Oh, we got a motion. Yeah. You made a motion. I guess call the question. And Gary made a second, and I just called a question. I'm sorry, we get off on these tangents and things <laughs> and so forth. Uh, 
Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Chair, can I just clarify this? Okay. The motion is to approve 199 feet. And all the other conditions as recommended yeah. by the plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Everything on this yeah. here. Everything that's Which on the spot. Includes the county having a reserve spot on the second. Right. All 13 conditions. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Gaber? No. Mr. Cree? Aye. Ms. Biggs? No. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. King? No. Chair Brown? My God, it gets right down to me, huh? <laughs> Was it, is it, is it three yeses and, three and, yes, three noes. Three yeses and three noes? It's a jump ball. It's <laughs> a jump ball? <laughs> this is why they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it my friends that voted yes, or is it my friends that voted no, or all of you, my friends? They voted both ways. I, yeah. think, <laughs> I think it's after the vote. Huh? <laughs> well, they always say that if you can't stand the heat, you ain't got no business in the oven or sitting in the hot seat. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I really. I respect staff and their recommendations. I also highly respect our appointed planning commission and and their recommendations too. And uh, so, going to vote yes. I have four eyes, three no. It's approved. Are y'all gonna speak to me now? <laughs> well, which one of us do you want to be your friends? <laughs> you get three the way you go. <laughs> okay, subject B, uh, at most energy easement across Christiansburg Middle School. So you know, Sorry. have a motion and a second. Is it any discussion? What was that? Oh, uh, that's subject B. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Would the. Have a, have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Cree? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Seven ayes. New business. Subject A appropriation of the FY15 budget. FY 14 15 budget phone, so yes. Mr. Chair, this is the appropriation that uh, follows the budget that was approved by the board um, several weeks ago. Um, there was not a substantial change um, in any of our numbers as a result of the budget that was approved by the General Assembly. Uh, the, the most significant change was a, a reduction of $66,107 in schools funding but we have confirmed with the schools that they will be able to offset that reduction in um, savings in other areas so um, the budget as proposed to you represents the same budget that was approved is that correct mr budget manager thank you that means that july 1 we will have plenty of money again right <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, I guess I need a, a motion and a, second. and a second. Second. Have a motion and a second. I uh, have a quick question, if I okay. don't mind. Um, one of the things I know this isn't, it's related to the budget, but wouldn't be necessarily covered by the appropriation, is that one of the things I'd asked for a couple of times during the um, discussion about the budget was um, the study for the library and the parks needs. Um, what is the status of that? That was that might be covered by the fund balance because it was a one-time. I think it was thirty thousand dollar cost. Are there plans to proceed with that in the coming year, or does that need to come it, forward? It, yes, it'll come back before the board for approval to move forward. But we do have sufficient funds in reserve to cover that study. Should the board cover the both those studies? Should the board want to move forward with those? Okay. Then I would like to to request to the board chair that perhaps we could discuss that. Yeah. Meeting in the near future. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. You better make a note of it, Mr. Mattis, because I forget. I'm, I'm watching. Right. I'm okay. watching Vicky Wright. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 
I think we have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. uh, the clerk, please call the roll. Mr. King? Aye. Ms. Biggs? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. Cree? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Senator Hines? Subject B, Fallen Branch Park and Ride Lot. A resolution recommending relocation of VDOT's Park and Ride Lot at exit at I-81, exit 118. A adjoining Fallen Branch Elementary School to Roanoke Street adjoining the US 460 bypass. So moved. Second. I don't think it needs any discussion. We didn't discuss that. We, <laughs> kept on that so, so, uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Fitz? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? Aye. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Mr. King? Aye. Mr. Cream? Aye. Chair Aye. Seven eyes. Subject C, Shawsville Volunteer Rescue Squad, Resolution of Recognition. Shawsville Volunteer Rescue Squad will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. Wow. And that will be, whereas on July 4th, well, no, it'd be July 4th this year, right? Or July 5th mm -hmm. or something? July 4th. July 4th with the parade and, and, and mm -hmm. all of that. And I'm pretty sure everybody's invited. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me speak to that. Just yeah, go ahead. Second, if I can. Uh, July the 4th is the Rotten's uh, Gala. It has free everything. It don't cost you a penny to get on, on the field. It don't cost you a penny to watch the fireworks. It don't cost you anything. All you got to do is bring your family and come out and have a good time. It starts at 5 o'clock for the parade. Uh, the fire, what, what do we call them? Work. Uh, Life members of the oh, fire, fire and rescue, not fire, but rescue. the rescue squad. Rescue. The okay. life members are going to be recognized as, and they will be our grand marshals for the parade. All, I believe there's 22 of them. And they will be on a big truck of their own that uh, will be decorated and um, just look forward to, to that being a real good day. Uh, a lot of places have cut back on the fireworks and ours is still growing. We, we've got one of the best firework displays, not just in Montgomery County, but in any place that I know around. So uh, come and enjoy it. Uh, if you don't want to stay, we've got, we've got uh, banjos and guitars and all the little band. We have the little band that, that uh, We'll play for about an hour. We have an auction for donated items that will last for 30, 45 minutes. And if you want to really hear me flood the dub, just come on down because I'll be the auctioneer for that. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a good time. It's, it's, it's a real good time and uh, everybody will enjoy it. The kids will have kids games all over the place. Uh, that uh, we've incorporated into this. So if you come down, like I say, it, it costs you nothing unless you want to buy a hot dog from somebody or something. But uh, other than that, uh, it's whether you want to spend money, not the fact that you need to or have to. So that's it. Before we vote, I'll, I'll say on behalf of the board to the Charlottesville Volunteer Rescue Squad, who currently has 31 members, and they serve 88 square miles of this county that uh, we really appreciate the service that they render to Eastern Montgomery uh, down in there. It's a lot of times we don't get a get an opportunity to say thank you and we appreciate you, but we are saying preach, uh, we appreciate you and thank you for all the years of service that you have provided to that part of the county. Uh, do we have a motion? A motion for motion, yeah, for yeah, this resolution. Absolutely. Motion and second. and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Perkins. Aye. Mr. Tuck. Aye. Mr. Gabriel. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Ms. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Cree. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. And Gary will really appreciate you sharing that information with the audience uh, this evening. Uh, addendum. Um, we have two items. Or, uh, the first item was the proposed uh, proposed 
purchase of 4.208 acres uh, on Cinnabar Road, which is identified as tax parcel 067-A-161A. Uh, so moved for the animal shelter. <laughs> You'll have a sec. Sec put it down over there. Yeah. It's just, you, 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 who, well, you said, mm -hmm. we got a we, we got a couple seconds and things like this, but <laughs> I, I think we have discussed this ever since I've been on the board, and uh, so I don't think no further discussion is necessary. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Gabriel. Aye. Mr. King. No. Ms. Fitz. Aye. Mr. Creed? Aye. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? No, and, and I'd like to just explain a little bit why. I know we have talked about a new animal shelter, but I believe that we're paying too much for this piece of real estate. Um, I believe that we can do it through other means, and that's why I'm opposing it. Not that I don't believe that we need, don't need a new animal shelter, but I just don't believe that this is a piece of property that we need to be purchasing. Chair Brown? Aye. Two no. I'm sorry. Five eyes. I shouldn't say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what I'm hey, Vicky, that man ain't holding up. <laughs> okay. Uh, second item is the uh, resolution that Miss O'Connor presented. The uh, before the. Yeah, this is just a, a believe a resolution that calling on our legislators to address this uh, this Medicaid issue. Um, now that the budget's been resolved, it's something that the um, the legislature can take up and, and try to deal with. We're asking them, as it says in the resolution, this would affect 6,200 of Montgomery County residents who would be covered by the existing Medicaid program. Federal dollars would flow directly back into the state, into the county to, to offset those costs. It would be a great benefit to um, rural hospitals, hospitals both in the county and around and around the region. So I think that's it's something worthwhile and something that, that we should support. Could I ask, I'd like to ask a question? Should about I that? second okay. it so that you can have discussion? Yeah. Okay. I'll second it to have discussion. Okay. And my question is this, back about four months ago, something like that, we have a clinic here in Christiansburg that would take anyone and some of the doctors about four months ago when they went there to give of their time were told we're not going to do that anymore. And I still don't know why. Do we ever find I've asked that? about that. I'd like to know why. If there's a reason why why in the world would you turn doctors away wanting to do good? Carol had an opportunity to talk to yeah. uh, can't think of her name. Michelle, thank you about that, and I appreciate you mentioning that because. I don't have my notes in front of me, so I'm going to go from what I remember, which is always a little dangerous for me. <laughs> but, um, I did discuss the issue with her. They had changed their model from the traditional free clinic to um, another type of concept. What they had done is what she told me is that. They closed the facility for a period of time when they were making that transition, that they were still using physicians and dentists who were interested in participating. She said they, that she took responsibility for not doing a particularly good job, and not a good job as she would have liked to have done, about explaining what had occurred. But they were going back and inviting any of the physicians who had volunteered before to come back. Now part of the change is, is that there's an application process that is required for their new model and some of the physicians have elected not to participate in that particular process. It's required by the federal government for the grants that they receive so they don't have a choice in whether or not people complete it but that's being offered to the physicians if they would um, be interested in returning. I can send you some more detailed information from my notes. Was but that? Do you know if part of that was the fact that they wanted to pay the the uh, physicians when they came up there, even though they didn't want, ask for it or want it? I don't believe so. The um, 
they have hired some physicians based on the, diff the expansion of services they were providing under the new model, but they still are working with the um, med school at Tech and they still are working with volunteers. But there is a process, and without my information in front of me, I, it escapes me what the name of it is, but there is a certification application process that physicians have to go to. And what she told me is that some have elected not to do that. But I'll certainly put the detailed information together and send it off to you. But I did ask specifically about that question. I wouldn't be out of order. Ms. Ms. Connor, I think, has some additional information to respond to your question. Yeah. So I think maybe to answer the first part of your question, with their new model, they will still have to accept anybody that walks through the door. Um, what they've done is they've done transitions from a free clinic to a community health center. And as part of the community health center, um, part of the agreement with them being able to take federal funds. With the free clinic, they were not allowed to accept federal funding, federal tax dollars. With the community health center model, they can. And as part of that, um, as was mentioned, there's a certain agreement that the doctors have to fill out um, because as a community health center, the federal government also takes care of their malpractice insurance. And so their doctors have to be covered under that malpractice insurance. But they will still have to accept everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. Does that help? Not really, but that's, that's OK. <laughs> They said, excuse me, they said they did this while they were transitioning? Correct. The, they, they can't operate as one while they're applying to be the other. And so there was a little bit of, of a, I think, like a two-week transfer. So they couldn't see any patients at that time? Correct. But they are currently open. They are currently open. Did their board decide to do this? Yes. Yeah, the, this was actually um, a multi-year process of considering what to do and how to do it and what the best path forward would be. So maybe what happened was while they were deciding all that, we didn't know they were well, even what's, discussing what's even worse it. worse is that the doctors didn't know that. Yeah, and I think that is a uh, miscommunication. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's what it sounds like. Well, I hope there will be some information put out to the community too and to the doctors that will let people know that what was the free clinic is still a free clinic but under a different name. And I'll be happy to pass along to Bronson. Okay. They did have paper there to plenty that they were changing over because we went there. And there, there were a couple of articles in the newspaper, press releases, those types of things. So it was definitely yeah, out there. A lot there. of people don't that go there don't necessarily have newspapers and right. that sort of thing. So hence the flyers. Right. Well, I've here. called I've called you up, so you come up right quick. <laughs> right quick. So. I'm sorry, I don't mean to belabor this issue, but I need to share a personal experience. <clears throat> I help a lady who used to go to the free clinic with some of her affairs. And after this change was made, she went in for, initially her appointment that she had already scheduled, they called and delayed her appointment for one month because of this change. When she then showed up for the rescheduled appointment, she had been paying five dollars and that was optional. When she showed up for this appointment, she was told she had to pay thirty-five dollars or she could not be seen. And I know this personally, I was with her. Um, so just just to add that in into this conversation. So under community health, yes ma'am. That they have to pay. That's what she was told. That and she said, I don't have that money with me. They said, well, we could take a check or a credit card, but they were not going to see her without her paying. And that was just that one experience. I don't know what the policy is. Who well, I think it would be nice for us to know. Yeah, yeah somebody needs to come here. Who, who administers this clinic? I mean, is this a private institution or is it? 
It's okay. Mm -hmm. Carol, you want to get money from the state? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I so. Get money from the state. Like Rather than having the discussion here without yeah. our information right. before, so it would be best for our, let me get you the information that I have gathered and put together. If there are still questions from that, I think we need to have the director, Michelle, come in because yeah. she was able to answer and address those particular issues. So rather than me speculating on some things, I think it would be best if we just wait. I'll get you the information that I have, and then we'll see if we need to bring her in. That would be fine with me. Um, can I say one thing about that? Yes, ma'am, right quick. Okay. My husband went to the neurologist and he works for the free clinic and his fee went up from twenty five to forty five dollars. And we didn't know that either. So I paid him the twenty five and told the receptionist that I had to pay the twenty later on. And he's out of Blacksburg, I can't pronounce his name, he's a Mexican doctor, I can't I also add that the reason I'm not having any medical care from the VA is because most of my paperwork is lost in the top of the off building. I'm not trying to start an activity system with that way now. I'm just saying if we're looking for free clinic and the things that are going on right now, I would be in a world of hurt. Okay. Now, back to the board. Regarding the resolution that's before us, um, I, I do understand but I have some concerns. When Medicaid and Medicare first started, I think it was about 5% of the state's budget. It is now about 22% of the state's budget. Um, I believe that initially this might be workout fee. Sounds great. Um, but there was a lot of things that sounded great with the Affordable Care Act that didn't turn out to be necessarily true and ended up being actually false and incorrect. Um, uh, I'm, that is part of the reason that I'm not in favor of this. I'm in favor of discussion of it, um, and there is a lot of good things that would perhaps could come out of this. Uh, but at this point in time, I'd like to see what the actual proposals are going to be through the legislative process, and so uh, that's why I'm not in favor of it at this point in time. No, man. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we're in a discussion with SLs now, so. Now is, okay. I may be wrong, and I apologize if I am, but I think the federal mm -hmm. guarantee the state, if they'd done this expansion, they would guarantee the money just for two years, mm -hmm. and then where's it coming from? 90% I mean, of it's supposed to come from them. Yeah, well, I'm saying it, it's just guaranteed for two years. No, sir, that's not correct. So my congressman told me wrong? And, and I guess my president told me wrong, too. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Well, I'm, okay, two years. Would you correct that for us right quick, that from your information? I think it's important. And, and to clarify, I am a Montgomery County resident. I'm not just a, I don't know, what do you want to call it otherwise. Uh, the money is guaranteed for the first three years, and then it will gradually go down, but they will continue to f supply at least 90%. So the, ca the cap that you're talking about is 10%, not the whole bill. Okay. okay. Well, that's not what I told. Thank Fair you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, that's what I understood, that well, it would just go down to 90%. For right now. Well, as you know. As law is written, absolutely, until it's written again and again. And as, you know, I, like I said, I had the President of the United States say, hey, I'm just going to be able to keep my health insurance. <laughs> well, well, he doesn't get to write the laws. All about the, the haves and have-nots. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Biggs. Okay, um, I seconded the motion, and, um, and I do want to make one spelling um, correction, and that is that we need a capital C in the word county in the last whereas. But I want to, I want to speak to the reason I seconded it, and the thing is that when I've been out and about talking to people, I can actually put a face with people that are hardworking individuals. Most of them are in the service industries, um, waitressing, that kind of thing, and they can't qualify the way it is right now. And these people are hard workers, and they have medical needs too. And I think, personally, it's immoral to ask them to pay for insurance for the people that serve in government when those very people are denying them the right to apply to get insurance. I 
I have a real hard, hard time with that. Um, I understand the politics in Richmond, and I understand that things are moving on with the budget, but this issue still needs to be addressed because as we lose the taxes that we all are paying and they're going to other states, it's going to affect economic development because I'm here to tell you, Lee County that lost their hospital, what company wants to come to Lee County when the closest hospital would be 45 miles away? This all has an economic development impact as well as a health care impact. And so I just wanted to state that is why I seconded the resolution. I feel very strongly about it. We have 6,200 people in Montgomery County and I can put faces on some of them. All you have to do is if you go out in the community and you start talking to people, you would be shocked how many people Hard-working people have no health care insurance. And I think we ought to be doing something about it. And that's all I have to say. I have the same um, concerns as Ms. Bates because I too can put some faces on individuals who when they tell me they are not feeling well, I say, go to the doctor, I don't know. They can't do it. They don't qualify. Uh, what do they do? They go to the hospital emergency room. We're paying for that through our insurance. We're also paying for it through our taxes. That's right. And um, the one thing that really upsets me is that, you know, um, when we did the car tax business, nobody got real upset about that in the beginning. And that eventually capped out at uh, 900 million, if I'm not mistaken. Um, also, uh, most of the people up here are a little too young to have remembered what it was like when Medicare came along. Um, I don't, I had, I was teaching at the time and it was part of my government course. And the same arguments that I'm hearing now were the same arguments that happened with Medicare. All right, how many people today in this room are not looking forward to 65? Me. Me. <laughs> in a certain way, in a certain way, because you do. People tell me, oh, I'm gonna qualify for Medicare. It's a given, right? And I'd hate to think what, uh, many of us would do without it. Mm -hmm. What about your parents? Mm -hmm. And I put myself in that category. And in my Medicare, I pay and my husband pays for um, additional Sorry. drug programs. Yeah. We have to pay uh, taxes yeah. on the money we receive. And you can determine how much you want to pay, but um, yeah, I do. You have to pay taxes on the money that you get from Medicare. I know that there will be a lot of things that will change about Medicaid. A lot of things have changed about Medicare. One of the things that had changed about Medicare was that they had to go back and investigate a lot of the medical community for the amounts that were being charged, and now, Doctors are somewhat reluctant to to get uh, give Medicare help. Some doctors, but very few of them will turn away a patient. Some of them will, but very few will say we don't accept Medicare. And so, if you need a heart surgeon and she doesn't accept Medicare you're not going to get any help from that particular person. When a hospital, she says, when a hospital is open, they have to take everybody that comes in. And so when a friend that I'm thinking about who is raising a grandson and she's working hard at a minimum wage job, when he gets a really bad sore throat and a cold or the flu, he goes to the emergency room. 
because she says, I can't afford to take him to a doctor for a sore throat or for a flu bug or for whatever else is out there. So, while Medicare was not perfect when it began, it has certainly sustained a lot of elderly individuals. And Medicaid may not be perfect at the moment, but at least we will get back money at least we will have it. At least the people who can't afford care now will be able to afford care. And we will have to, there's no doubt about when you start a new program of, of this kind, that glitches will occur and you will have to tweak it. I don't, I don't care what it is. But to me, I agree with Ms. Biggs, it's immoral. For us who have the means and accept hospital care as a benefit or med um, insurance as a, med uh, as a benefit, to say people who earn $15,000 a year working hard that they cannot have care. I, 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 I agree with Ms. Biggs on that one. And I'll also tell you something. I'm old enough that when I was uh, nine years old, in 1947 or something like that, there was no such thing as Medicare. There was no such thing as hospitalization. Blue Cross Blue Shield was just getting started in Virginia. I had a very serious break to my leg, which to this day I carry evidence for. I have two plates and three screws in my leg. So I went to the hospital, private care hospital. My daddy took me. Do you know what they did? They put me in there and they said, now, uh, Mrs. Seward, I just want to talk to you about health insurance today. Do you have any? And my father said no. And they said, well, we'd like to talk to you about Blue Cross Blue Shield before you bring your daughter in here to be taken care of in this emergency room. And my father turned around and walked away. He said, I will take my daughter elsewhere because I can afford to pay for it. But don't ask me for money as a hospital before you even treat her. Now that occurred when I was nine. We don't get a lot of that today. So, I would support this resolution a hundred times because I think it's absolutely essential. Plus I think it's immoral as Ms. Big said. So, that's my speech for today. Thank you. Other comments? Well, I'll say one or two briefly. I consider the vote for this resolution more important than the vote on the cell tower. This is how I consider it. And it's it sums up to be between the haves and the have nots. You know, and, and a lot of the have nots uh, really need some help. And I grew up in a large family. The only way we got to see a doctor is we were about dead because there wasn't no health insurance. It was very little money and things like that. So, and then you know people who are, who feel bad and so forth, but you say, well, why don't you go to the doctor? Well, I don't have no health insurance. I don't have no money. I can't afford it. You know, something like this. So I think that, uh, I believe that voting for uh, in support of this resolution is the right thing to do uh, for the 62 citizens, 62,000 citizens in in Montgomery County without health care. I mean, 60. 200. 200. Yeah. Other comments? And we have a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. King. Aye. Ms. Biggs. Aye. Mr. Creed. No. Ms. Perkins? Aye. Mr. Tuck? No. Ms. Mr. Gabriel? Aye. Chair Brown? Aye. Five, two, no. 
Okay, that was it on for the agenda. County attorney's report. Uh, no report, Mr. Chair. Uh, county administrators. Mr. Chair, just a couple of items. I seem to always say that. Uh, <laughs> First off, I wanted to mention to the board that I, I did forward an email earlier this afternoon uh, regarding the state budget impacts from some information that Carol had put together last week. As we stated when we talked about the adoption of the budget um, funding, it was only in effect of about $66,000, but there's a couple of paragraphs in that email if you'd like to see the details on that. Also, I'm very pleased to announce uh, that the county has been notified that we have won two national awards from the National Association of County Information Officers. The first one is an award for our uh, annual report video that was done last year, and that was a first place award in the category um, of annual reports. So that was a tremendous achievement and Ruth and her staff are to be very well commended for that. Also we won a superior award which is given, uh, it's not first place, but it's a superior award uh, for our graphic design uh, for this year's Brooming and Blooming program and Chris Coleman was actively involved with that. So we want to certainly congratulate Ruth and her staff for that good work. Uh, we also are aware that another award may be coming in the next couple of weeks, and we'll certainly make you aware of that when we are allowed to tell you about it. So that's been good. And the only other thing I have is we do not have a work schedule. We have um, had a work session for the board before the PSA meetings each month, but for the July and August meetings, uh, we do not plan to have a work session because I know several folks are going to be traveling. Uh, so on July the 7th, we won't have a work session before the PSA meeting, and we may not have a PSA meeting. I don't Probably know. Probably won't. Probably won't. But, and that's all I have. Okay, Mr. King. I don't have much. Uh, still, uh, the residents out on Old Sire Wood are still having issues with that. Dirt glue? Dirt glue. Mm. If any of you have a chance, please write out there and look okay. at it. Oh, the dirt glue? Yeah. Oh. After that rain last night, oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Might get stuck, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a so, yeah, pretty pretty popular district district out there. You really get involved with the citizens, oh, don't yeah. you? Yeah. They uh we're going to have a community meeting. The Old Sirewood just there on the road, they want to have a meeting and discuss some things. So they're going to call and let me know. And if I could, I'd like to have you, Craig, to go out and meet with them too, if you have time. Is it going to be safe? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let us, know. This let, us, know let, us let us know yeah. um, when they have the meeting well, schedule. Yeah, we might be able to come if it's yeah. 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 It's just going to be the residents of Old Sirewood. Mm -hmm. okay. Be glad to. Okay. Ms. Green. No report. Ms. Perkins. Just one short report. I won't talk as long as I did before. But one of the things that struck me about this whole business of Medicare and Medicaid, um, I, I didn't realize, but at some point uh, I was appointed to the Fairview Home. Um, and uh, the meeting was uh, Thursday morning. And so I had to ask how to get there, and I made the wrong turn. I went right instead of left, I think, or one of those two, you know. And I took the scenic route through the town of Pulaski and a lot of other things. But I got to that home, and I was so impressed. And I looked at the people who were there, and, you know, they came down the hall and they spoke and they were happy. And I realized that the people who were there would have no place to go if we didn't have that home. And obviously since the new person has taken over and some CSB money, Carol, is that correct? Was yeah. has been in there, some other funds. It is clean, it is nice, uh, the rooms are comfortable, um, the people are well taken care of, um, I just, and, and they have such a, a variety of issues 
and of course they're elderly. Um, and I'm thinking um, what it used to be like. Uh, and then compared that these are government, this is government sponsored because what, all, um, all the counties in our area, except for Craig, I believe. except for Craig, uh, help to support it. And to tell you the truth, the next time it comes up for money, I'm going to listen very carefully because I, 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 I'm just, I, I was totally taken aback by all that I saw, and yet knowing that this is one really good thing that we do for people with uh, just a little bit of the tax money that we get, that elderly people can be taken of like that, taken care of like that, and they don't have to be in situations that you wouldn't want anybody to be in. So to me, that was that's a good appointment. I don't go but once every quarter, <laughs> and I now know how to get there. Um, and I won't take the scenic route. I'm going with Carol, and I'm hoping that uh, I'll know uh, a little bit more about it when when I come back the next time. But anyway, um, that's basically my report. Um, I, I had three different experiences this week uh, with Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Administration, um, with that Fairview home, and I will just tell you that there, there is a lot of good out there, and I don't doubt that there is a lot of misappropriation, or not, maybe not a lot, but there's some, but there is an awful lot of good out there that's being done for people with some of our tax money, and so I'm very glad that even though I didn't know I was appointed to it, <laughs> I went and I missed the place, but I did have a tour. So anytime anybody wants to go with us, anytime you want to go out there, I know how to get there. I'll be more than happy to take you there so you can see. But as it was wonderful as I drove up when the, the ladies and gentlemen were sitting outside. It was beautiful weather and they kept saying, well, hello, how are you? Uh, you know, they were happy, so I was happy. Can I say something, brother? Mm. Mr. <laughs> Chair? No, ma'am. I know you keep telling me, but uh, I'd, to, I'd like to go with her next time. <laughs> well, you can yeah. see her after the meeting if you don't talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we can uh, mute the. After. Okay, Supervisor Biggs. Um, yeah, three things. First of all, I'm so excited about the vote on the land for the animal shelter. Um, got leads, 19 years. I'm really excited that we're going to move on it now. Uh, the second thing is, um, if all goes well, um, I probably will be on my vacation at our next board meeting, which would be Monday, July 14th. That's usually the week that we're out of town. The third thing is just something to think about. I was listening to um, a segment of Doctors Radio, and it concerned doing a study on uh, firefighters and rescue people in the age group between 45 and 58. And they did. Um, they were looking to see if they, you know, since they had such stressful jobs, did this come into play with any kind of heart problems? So they, instead of just doing the typical heart test, they did some uh, further testing and found out that um, in this study that 50% of these people had heart problems that were not seen just, you know, when you do a simple, I guess, assessment which led to a whole discussion about, um, you know, what should we do for people in these type jobs, which you could extend that even to, you know, police officers and that kind of thing. Um, they eat on the run. They work long hours. Sometimes their sleep patterns are disturbed. They're always on duty when they're not on duty. And all that adds up to a lot of stress. Well, I started thinking about it because we have volunteers, you know, for rescue and fire and I don't know if there's anything that we do to encourage exercise or diet or I don't know because I'm just not that familiar with everything but it really brought to mind that you know we could have people that 
have the same kind of thing going on inside their bodies and not know it because of the stress. So I'm just sort of throwing it out there, not to do anything with it, but just to say that it just got me thinking about our people. And um, I don't know if there's anything we could do about it, but I just thought I'd bring it up. Thank you. And that's it. Okay, uh, Supervisor Tuck. Well, a few things. I didn't miss our last meeting. Um, I was chaperoning uh, Christopher High School students, and I was assigned uh, 10 young ladies to chaperone while we were moving around in New York City. I have never spent that much time in Forever 21, H&M, <laughs> and the Disney Store in my life. Uh, it was a new experience for me, but I made well. sure that everyone in my group uh, came back. Uh, we broke down on the way back oh, and no. ended up at a, a truck stop on the uh, way back, and, and we survived that for three hours hanging out with the truck stop, waiting for another bus to arrive. Uh, but uh, oh, so I'm sorry I missed, but it was a good experience. Um, second of all, a lot of times uh, we're very critical of what the state doesn't provide us and the additional requirements that they put on us. But I would like to thank the state for stepping up in regards to the park and ride. It was their issue. It is park and ride is a VDOT mm -hmm. issue, yes, but that could have been put off, and, mm -hmm. they, and they did step up both sides of the aisle, um, mm -hmm. and and so I'm thankful of that. Uh, the last thing is I had the opportunity to go to Joel Donahue's funeral. Mm -hmm. And Joel was a complicated fellow. He came out during the course of the, the, his, his um, celebration of his life that sometimes he was a difficult fellow to get along with. And at the same time, he was such a giving person. Uh, there were several people. One lady drove up from North Carolina. She had been a neighbor of Joel's and uh, she had never seen snow before. She grew up in the Outer Banks. And Joel came when she got snowed in. She didn't have power, and he invited her into her home for nearly two weeks. There were emails from Korea, Germany, talking about foreign exchange students, where he had given so much of his life uh, to making sure that they adapted well here in our country. Uh, one of the fellows from Korea described how he made Korean meals just for him to try to make it an easier transition for him. Um, from whether it was volunteering time to do taxes um, to, for elderly uh, and giving of himself. And so it just goes to show you, you don't always know everything about right. a person. And uh, it, it, he will be truly missed in our community. He had given a lot of himself. And, and while there were times that he didn't hesitate to express his <laughs> opinion, uh, yes. uh, it, it was all meant in the best. Yes. So Chris, um, you want us to put some kind of resolution forward from the board for him, that probably in the just future. Just in the minutes, just acknowledging his contribution. But shouldn't we do a resolution for his be, service? Be fine. That'll be really good. Yeah. He's a good man. Mr. Gabriel. Um, just a, one very brief thing is that um, we have a I have a, a EDC meeting coming up um, next. Well. But yeah, I guess this later this week, um, and um, I won't be there because I'll, I'll be out of town. But um, one of the things that I think they're going to discuss right there is that they, they have a they have a trouble over the summer with quorums um, because you need uh, voting members there, and there's no provision in the current EDC bylaws for alternates or for someone else to attend in someone else's mm -hmm. stead. So I believe they're going to start discussing that if they have a quorum at the next meeting um, about uh, provisions for alternates. So I wanted to put that on people's radar that maybe sometime in the future we might need to or might want to appoint an alternate for that position in case someone can't make it. So that's all. Okay, it's sort of left up to me. Uh, Chris, thank you for the comments on um, Mr. Donahue and, and, and attending uh, his service. And uh, I'm looking for we are adjourned. I have no report. Well, I, I just wanted to ask one thing. Okay. So we're adjourned. I know. Okay. Well, unadjourned for your one thing. <laughs> could, we, could we explore what this lady asked for the doing tax the public thing. address about the taxes um, and have the, the staff would you look into that and see yeah, that's where good. we are? Yeah, right. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Okay, we'll be glad to check into that for now you. Now we'll adjourn and you can come back and come up and talk to her about going to Fairview Home with you.